And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Good evening, live, not live, we're recording, from <laughs> my apartment building on the campus of Georgetown University. My name is Carlos. I'm here with Liz, and we're here to talk about nothing else than the Tampa Bay Rowdies. That's a lie. We can talk a little bit of our, our lives before we jump into the Rowdy stuff. Um, I'm excited, Liz. Lots of fun stuff to talk about from this past week. We're recording a bit later than usual. Admittedly, I have been drowned in everything but Rowdy stuff for the past week, but we're here. We're here to talk about the Rowdies. We're here to talk about a massive game this upcoming weekend. Tons of huge implications there. Um, I don't have to talk too much about that game against Pittsburgh. We'll have plenty to say about that later on. Before we get into any of that, Liz, what's going on in your life? How are you doing back home in Tampa Bay? Um, it's good. It is still so very warm here. All my coworkers are saying, oh, what a nice chilly morning. All my coworkers live in Utah. Um, that's, yeah. where my, my, that's where my job is based out of. Uh, but they're all like, what a nice chilly morning. And I'm like, it's, I'm still sweating. Yeah. Yeah, that's, the, that's a summary of my week. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's actually been rather nice up here. I woke up and it was like in the mid 60s, um, which had been really, really nice. Um, D.C. has been surprisingly warm early this semester. It's been really, really hot. Actually, it's a lot like Tampa. It's super humid. And the worst part is I don't have a beach to escape to here. I have like the Potomac River and it's disgusting and it's gross. Mm -hmm. And it's just that the only sounds it, like bad. something you would catch in the Potomac River. Yeah, yeah, I know. We don't go in there for a reason. Um, if you follow it upstream enough, you get to the cool DC United Stadium. So there's a cool thing on the okay. river. But um, that being said, definitely not worth swimming in. Nonetheless, Liz, let's jump into it. This past week in the Rowdies played Loudoun United and we won. I'm not going to say comfortably, but we, we, we won, I think, in a pretty controlled fashion. Won nothing in front of a decent crowd. Um, that win pushed us to 60 points on 32 games played. We're three points behind our first-place counterparts, our opponents for this weekend, Pittsburgh, um, who sit on 63 points. None of us predicted the score correctly, um, but me, Eureka, and the guest spot did all predict the Rowdies win. Um, the guest spot is on 25 points. Eureka is on 24 points. I'm in 22 points. And James plus Liz helping out uh, are on 18 points there. Liz, unfortunately, predicted the draw. Um, carrying on the James tradition of being rather pep pessimistic, I'd say, going <laughs> to these games. Uh, we'll, oh, we'll wait till you see my prediction for the next game. There it oh, is. No. I was going to say, let's see how the uh, prediction continues oh, no. <laughs> going on into the Pittsburgh game. Um, yeah, we'll have a ton of stuff to talk about about that Loudon game. I think there's plenty to talk about there, and I think even more to talk about when it comes to the game against Pittsburgh, the implications of that. Tons of fun stuff ahead. Tons of fun stuff this weekend at Al Lang Stadium. Um, before we jump into any of that, just want to quickly – ask everybody to join the hundreds who have already liked and subscribed to rblr sports on youtube join us like subscribe on any of our platforms including youtube uh but we are also on anywhere you find podcasts apple podcasts google podcasts um i don't know google podcast doesn't exist anymore but yeah, whatever podcast platform there is we're there um if there's a podcast platform you'll find rblr sports there drop a like and a follow and follow us on all of our social medias including instagram twitter tiktok and facebook at rblr sports all right that all out of the way the history of it of failed Google products is, is fascinating to me and I love following it. So Google podcast is just one in the illustrious history. There you go. <laughs> there you go. We should start another podcast about that. We should be there. Um, you could go on for several episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on from that, I can't think of a smooth transition from talking about Google nope. podcast and the rowdies, but let's talk about the rowdies. Liz, do you want to take us through the quick recap of what happened against Loudon United in our one nothing win? Um, we scored a goal. Yeah. Yeah. That was about anything, all we did. <laughs> anything else of note there? Or we were just talking about really, not really. Like I went to go rewatch the game. And I hate to say it. I was just as bored rewatching it as I was watching it the first time. Sure. Sure. <laughs> it was they, a very lackluster game. 
yeah, I think it's a good way to put it. I and mean, we can break that down a bit, maybe about why that happened or you yeah. know, if that's a good, good performance, if we can call it a good performance or not. Um, but definitely, like you said, there was just the one goal um, on the night. Uh, the Rowdy started off pretty strong. There was a nice looking cross from Cal Jennings early on uh, that went across to Perez. Perez almost scored, hit the crossbar actually on a sliding shot early in, in like the second minute. Um, would have been really, really cool for him to get a goal on the board that early. Um, we kind of kept the pressure on. I think we started exciting and it kind of fell off towards the end. Um, Antley had a really beautiful looping cross to JJ Williams in the seventh minute, just five minutes later. Um, and JJ Williams headed a ball just wide to the right of the post. Highly, highly unfortunate not to be up to nothing just seven minutes in. But it wasn't until much later, JJ Williams uh, would rip another one of his kind of signature, you know, mid distance shots on the ground that kind of sometimes work, but kind of not um, found the post actually in the 29th minute, one of those shots. And it was none other than Cal Jennings who just seems to be a hound for the ball, just follows the ball wherever it goes and finished at a really, really tight, impressive angle um, from the right side of the goal. Really, really good stuff from him. Put the rowdies up one, nothing like Liz said, it was the only goal on the night. The high press was working really well. You could see us forcing loud into plenty of turnovers and by halftime we were up one, nothing. And not much else to talk about there. In the second half, the Rowdies would have a couple more chances, a few good-looking shots, and that was about it. There wasn't really too much to do. Loudon would create a couple of decent-looking opportunities. Sparrow didn't really have too much work um, you know, laid out for him. Backline did everything they had to do. Forrest Lasso was back in the starting lineup. Um, defense looked certainly better than uh, the, the last home game against Memphis. Uh, we can talk about that back line in a second. So let's jump into the breakdown a little bit, Liz. Um, what did you see? Is, did you see any distinct differences between the first half and the second half performances? It's usually how we like to break down these these games. We like to break it down into one half and another half. Um, did you see any key differences, or, or did we just kind of keep a consistent level of play the whole way through? Uh, I mean, we were pretty consistent for the most part. I want to say, obviously, because we scored a goal in the first half, we had a little more fight. Um, but I feel like we kind of sat back in the second half. Uh, and I think Loudon also sat back. So that's why it was just kind of a boring game um, other than Loudon's many, many fouls. <laughs> yeah, it was. We talked about this before we started recording. It was certainly like a pretty chippy game, um, yeah. which I wasn't really. Ex- I mean, I don't know. Uh, Loudon's a team that, again, to remind everybody, I don't think we mentioned this yet. They're in second to last place in the conference. They were eliminated from the playoff contention coming into this game. They really didn't have much to play for. Um, obviously, have been struggling this season. I remember at the beginning of the season, um, I was kind of hyping them up because they were playing pretty well yeah. for a Loudon squad, and they, they fell off. Um, that being said, I, we talked about this earlier as well. I two guys that I'm, I'm pretty one one guy I'm pretty close friends with actually on the Loudon team was in one of my classes. Um, played soccer here at Georgetown. We were in the same class, the same year and everything. Um, he played for Charlotte before he ended up in Loudoun. Um, his name's Chris Hagar. He had a decent game himself, and he was getting into it with uh, Connor Sparrow and Connor Antley. Um, and it was really funny to watch that from afar, watch that like from where he played college soccer. It was the same guy that played college soccer over here, just as chippy as he was playing against UConn or DePaul or whatever. Um, kind of mixed feelings seeing that happen against the rowdies but um ultimately that was kind of characteristic of how loud and played the game i mean it, just a really chippy game very aggressive um very physical surprisingly i mean you'd think for a, a smaller team for the most part that wouldn't really be that successful but i think to their credit they played a pretty decent game uh i mean i i, I think i'm i'm not like disrespecting them by saying that the rowdies are clearly the better team and we were playing at home, you know, home atmosphere, humidity, the heat, and everything. Um, and they played a decent game against us. I would say, like, I expected to win by more. Um, I think first half we came out firing on all cylinders for a second. And then, like you said, by the time we went up the goal, coming out in the second half was a bit sluggish. Loudon was just looking to kind of score on those counterattacks, and we just kind of sat back and held the ball. Not a problem there, but definitely – maybe boring to watch like you said um so i think that was pretty fun uh ultimately got the three points but anything else to talk about do you do you can we say anything about the second half were there any like moments of, of interest any key moments that we can point to because I'm, I'm trying to think back and 
No. I'm not really thinking of anything. <laughs> no, no. The only um, explanation I can think of for why it got chippy is just um, you have your younger players who just maybe in a moment of anger or when they're frustrated because they're down by a goal might, you know, make that you know, uh, not so great tackle um, at the, in, in the heat of the moment. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. And, and For I sure. think Loudon kind of displayed their age, which again, my nothing against them because they are uh, playing, you know, professional soccer um, and they are on their way, hopefully to DC United. Um but I, I will say there is something quite like the uh, the fight in a um, a Loudon team with uh, playing with nothing nothing to lose. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. It, it's actually like they have a lot of talent, by the way. Like a lot of these guys individually could be starting for teams around the league. I know, like they're not playing their best or anything. But again, I'm gonna I'm gonna show my bias very explicitly here. And Aiden Rocha went to Georgetown as well. He was uh, two years older than me, so I got to see him play for a couple seasons here. Great guy as well. Um, I mean, he had a fantastic game as well. He was cre- like the chances that Loudon did have were basically facilitated by him. Um, and and like he's a guy that 100 is going to be climbing the ranks really quickly. Whether that's going to DC United or, or you know moving on up to a I think more established USL team. Um, I think he's somebody that definitely has the capacity to grow really quickly. I mean, there, there's a bunch of really talented guys here. I think collectively, it's kind of difficult for them to like gel pretty quickly when there's so much movement in the roster and the lineup. But there's a lot of talent here. Tommy Williamson, that striker for them, is a really, really talented forward. Um, 24 years old, plenty of talent on his part. Has been having a pretty good season, actually. That being said, just didn't have... He just didn't have the ball, really. Like he didn't really have the ball up top. There's not much more he can do um, if he doesn't have anything going for him. Only ended up having one shot on the night. But I think that's a testament to the Rowdies play as well, Liz. I, I, I think we played a good game. It wasn't necessarily fun to watch, which I think I can agree with you on. But I think we played a good game overall. Um, first half was just a bit more fun than the second half. So I, I guess that transitions us into the next part here. Um, general reactions. Can we say this was a good result, a good performance, or maybe were we expecting more against a not so good team? I was expecting more against a not so good team. Personally, um, I, I have to say it is uh, something to say about Loudon that they only held us to one goal. They didn't score any, which that sucks. Yeah. But like they only held us to one. Uh, there, yeah. there are sometimes where we would, you know, roll over. For sure. Um, so they, they, I, I, I hate to say, I think Loudon, Loudon lost, but I still think they maybe had a better game than us. Yeah, I think that's an it's interesting controversial way to hot take. But yeah, it's I, an I, interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's a totally like fair thing to say as well because looking back at our past results, Liz, um, actually I forgot about this, but I was looking back and I just realized that this was the first time we've scored less than two goals in a game since that loss to Pittsburgh on August 5th. So two months ago. Mm. Okay. That means every game since that one nothing loss to Pittsburgh, we scored four against Monterey, two against Tulsa, two against Miami, two against Hartford, two in the loss to Memphis, uh, two in the win against Louisville, three in the tie against San Antonio, two in the loss against Memphis, and two in the win against Hartford. So that's every game consistently we've been scoring at least two goals for the past two months. So Which what does is, it say that uh, the team second to the bottom held up to <laughs> one goal? Yeah, right, exactly. Team, yeah. had a good game. Like they yeah. should be, they should be very like I, I should have said this earlier, but they yeah. should be very proud of themselves. Quite frankly, yeah, they're holding a team second second to the top. You yeah. know, vying for the supporter shield to one goal. Right, Their teams much higher than them couldn't do that. Yeah, and and we we were creating opportunities in the first half, but I think it was one of those cases where. And this has happened earlier this season. Again, like when James and I have been talking about playing these like teams that are towards the bottom of the table, it's happened more than once at this point in the season where we kind of play down to that competition. Um, mm-hmm. In this case, I don't really think we did that. I think it was more like we played well in the first half and then got comfortable with that one nothing result. It wasn't really too much more we had to do. There wasn't too much danger of Loudon ever really, you know, threatening to tie the game up per se. Um, the final stats were they had nine shots, which was honestly more than I thought they did. Only one of those was on target the entire night. 
Um, the Rowdies hit the post twice. We had five shots on target, 16 shots in total. So we were creating opportunities. It might not have felt that way because it was pretty like condensed in the first half. Yeah. But I, I think it is a testament to Loudon for sure. And it's worth giving them credit because they, I think, you know, holding a team that hasn't scored less than two goals in the past two months um, is really, really interesting um, and, and definitely, a, a, you know, testament to their skill level and I guess collective defensive, um, you know, approach. Uh, so, again, I, I don't want to feel like I'm giving Loudon too much, like, credit either. We're here to talk about the Rowdies. Like, we won at the end of the day. So, yeah. and they didn't. They lost. Um, so, but it, it is interesting. And I think it's worth pointing out that we've scored – more than two goals for the past two months against every team we've played, and then Loudon holds us to just one. We still won, but interesting there. Um, I, I don't say that either to like scare anybody about our offense, by the way, because I think our attack has been not a problem at all. Um, if there has been a problem, it's just been injuries and whatnot. I mean, again, plenty of stuff happening with the back line. Aaron Guillen still out. Um, like, who else are we missing? Um, why am I blanking? Uh, you know, I mean, the guys that have been out for a majority of the Leo, season. Oh, really have... that could lead us into Leo being on the bench. Right. I We oh. haven't mentioned that yet, by the way. We haven't mentioned that, have yeah. we, right? No. Okay. So maybe let's just jump into that then, because let's talk yeah. about the injuries for a second. We have Forrest Lasso back, right? He started yes. again. Um, he was starting with yes. Kleeman on the back line, and then Antley and Doherty were also kind of playing defensively. Um, mm-hmm. So generally guys have been kind of playing in the positions that they're used to with the exception of maybe Doherty kind of playing on the back line. Um, still kind of weird for him. Um, before we talk about Leo and like the implications that could have, let's just mention the back line for a second because we have Forrest Lasso back. We're still missing a key, key, key piece in Guillen and Kleeman starting when he's, you know, had a lot of games coming off the bench. Um, how do you feel about the back line right now, Liz? I mean, it, where we had a couple of games, in the previous couple of weeks where it's been a little scary for us. Lasso hasn't been in and we've been conceding like four goals, three goals, um, barely getting out of games, you know, out of these games alive. We lost to Memphis at home the week prior and then bounced back nicely against Hartford uh, with uh, uh, Lasso still out of the game. But now we have Lasso back. Clemens playing and he's a decent center back as well. Antley's good. Um, do we feel good about the back line or should we still be a bit concerned that a key piece like Guillen is still out? I'm still concerned. I think again, we play, I think we played down a little bit in the last game. We may have had it a little easier last game. Um, we did have lasso back. I did see a notice. I, I am a, I am a harsh critic of lasso, um, but I did see a noticeable improvement with lasso in the back line again. Absolutely. And I will, I, I will say that I will give him that credit for sure. Um, so that makes me feel better, but n- I'm still worried about Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's definitely valid as well. Um, I think on that note, right, we had a, before the game against Loudon, we did have that game against Hartford that Wednesday prior. Um, so there was about three days in between those games as well. Maybe. Maybe a factor could have been fatigue as well. But mm-hmm. like, you have, again, we have guys coming back slowly, um, including a, you know, a guy named Leo Fernandez that we can mention mm-hmm. a bit more in a second. But that does mean that there's tons of guys playing a lot of minutes too, right? Yeah. There's not really, right, you know, the game against Hartford, um, which we talked about in the last episode, obviously. Um, I just want to reference that because Lasso was still kind of coming back from injury. Um, you had Kleeman basically by himself as his the only center back. You can't really sub him off. So Kleeman has to play a full 90. Um, Antley basically has to play a full 90. There's not really any other defenders. And then Doherty also has to play a full 90 because he's the only other guy that can kind of play defense. You also have Joshua Perez that's been playing defense sometimes on like the fullback spot. Um, but you really don't want to be moving around guys too much like that. And then this past game against Loudon, you bring in Lasso. So you have another center back, which is really nice to like bolster the, you know, a normal back line. But you still don't have any guys to sub them in, right? So there's no Guillen on the bench that can come in and, you know, take off some minutes or whatever. If there's an injury, you know, whatever. Like, so 
Kleeman played a good chunk of minutes here back to back, 180 minutes within two days. Um, that being said, I think it was fine because it was Loudon and the game before it was Hartford. These are literally the bottom two teams in, in the Eastern Conference. So if there's a time to do that, it's now. But I think your point is taken that there should be a little bit of concern, a little bit of caution when it comes to still not having Guillen back because there's no one to really come in and take off any minutes. Let me caveat that by saying we didn't have a week a weekday game this week, so we had a full seven days, you know, or a six days, I guess, in between games. So I don't think fatigue will be a problem, but there's still not depth. And I think that's where your point is taken about concern of not having a guy like Guillen back for sure. Yeah, like I was just checking. I remember hearing um, when I was watching the game earlier, uh, this is the first time in several weeks that we've had a full bench. Um, and I was like, oh, let me go check that out while, while Carlos is talking. And I'll listen, I'll check it real quick. And then I realized, I was like, oh, and then everyone on our bench is a midfielder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'll say, I mean, that's a much better situation than in pre- yes. like pre. pre- I was trying to mix previous and prior there, and I was coming out and I was like, previous. In prior weeks, when we've literally only had like four words and yeah. Brano in goal or on the bench. So, yeah, yeah when choose, Brano is one of our possibilities of yeah, putting on the it, field, it was, it was literally like for more weeks than I was comfortable with. It was literally just M. Kosana, uh, Raiko, Martinez. And like maybe Armin or Dogard on the bench. So it was like attackers, right? It was not a lot there. Yeah. So having midfielders in, guys that can like kind of play defense if really needed, makes me a bit more comfortable. Armin can play in the back line if he really has to. He can play fullback. Dogard can play like wing back. And then Hilton, yeah, I'm not putting Hilton on the back line, but, um, that being said, I feel a bit more comfortable with the situation now than I did just a few weeks prior. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat the concern by saying I feel more comfortable, but I would like, la- oh, sorry, Guillen back yeah. sooner rather than later. Maybe even Era, though. I mean, Leo Fernandez came out of nowhere, but like if he can come out of nowhere, maybe Zach Aravo can come out of nowhere. He plays defensive mid. He can probably play on the back line if we really had to. Um, I would hope so. Wasn't when did he get like how long has he been injured now? The whole season. Uh, yeah. the whole season. And, and he was one of those guys that got injured really, really early on and just hasn't really had a minute since. Um like, if you give me three seconds. Leo's while, happened I just keep Leo's happened in preseason, right? Yeah. So Aravo so played did... a total of one, two, three, four, five, six games. He got okay. Uh, the game was April 29th against Detroit. In Detroit, and he hasn't played since. Um, he like actually ended up getting on the score sheet one time in those five games, which is kind of interesting for his position. So he could have contributed. I, I was really excited to see what he could contribute this year. Um, that being said, uh, yeah, it, we're still in a weird situation with limited players. Um, one of those other guys that's out is Abel Caputo. He hasn't been on the bench since August 12th. He was on the bench okay. against Monterey Bay back then. Um, didn't get any minutes then, but picked up some sort of injury. I think it was during warm-ups um, in the later game um, where he picked up an injury. So, unfortunate, um, last time he got minutes was that loss at Pittsburgh. So we're st- And that's another guy that can play on the back line, by the way. Abel Caputo has played fullback. He can play center back if he really has to. Um, so another guy that we can have back there hopefully sooner rather than later to add a bit of depth. That would definitely minimize my concern just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So, last thing I'll say, which – tangentially has to do with this game it really has nothing to do with the game itself by the way i think my conclusions on the game were fine we won and i'm happy and i'm really glad that i got to see two of my boys play against the rowdies um and lose uh but that being said you mentioned a key 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 player that's back on the roster active didn't get any minutes his name's leo fernandez he was the mvp last season he's incredible talent just insane talent like a game changer so it's incredible to have him back active on the bench he's coming off a really long injury but he's just such an insanely talented player 
I'm not sure I would still play him though. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying all of that to lead up. I am glad so, we didn't play him in, for Loudon because he would have gotten injured again. Yeah, I mean that, that, that's a possibility <laughs> for sure. Um, like I was telling, we were talking about this actually briefly before we started recording. The offense is clicking. Like the attack is is not really a problem right now. I think Leo Fernandez right now, coming off this long term injury, so so talented. But I I feel like he's a guy that you bring in as a sub in the latter parts of a game right now. Hundred percent. Okay. Oh, hundred percent. I I think I think just un- unless he has some dramatic change where like. The man is is Superman. He has healed. His bones are made of iron now, and he can, you know, he's he's a hundred percent good to go. I, I don't see him starting for the rest of the season. Quite frankly, I think he would make a Absolutely. great sixty seventieth minute sub. I think that's where he will be key. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. Our deep, our I'm sorry, our offense is clicking. We are doing great. We have that Jennings and 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 um. Oh my God, J.J. J. J. Williams. Yeah, J. Oh J. Williams. Yeah, I lost his last name for a minute. Um, we have that that Jennings to Williams is going really, really well. I love that. That's working. Um, I I don't want to change anything uh, offense wise. So Absolutely. I would be very surprised if he started. Quite frankly. Yeah, I mean he's coming off a really long term injury. It's not to say like if he came in like he would like this is all. Be- I'm only saying this because I thought it might be a hot take, and we'll see. I guess. If, if Rowdy's Twitter agrees, but my only thing is he's been out for a really long time and there's not really a need to fix what isn't broken. Um, again, we haven't scored less than two goals in literally two months. Like we are scoring lots of goals. We're averaging two goals a game in the past two months, which is absurd. Um, my like concern is on the back line. Um, just because of depth of injuries, the guys are talented as hell in the back there and in the back line, but that's where I would be more concerned. So, unless Leo Fernandez can start at center back, then I think I'm okay with him coming off the bench later in the game. I mean, by the way, him coming off the bench is also not a bad thing at all. Like, can you imagine you're Pittsburgh, you're playing against the Rowdies, you're playing in the humidity. It gets like the 70th minute and you are exhausted and still tied. And all of a sudden you see Leo Fernandez warming up and coming off the bench. The MVP from last year. Yeah. Like, well, can you imagine like the, the, just the toll that will take on your psyche if you're Pittsburgh? So it's funny. we have a couple of big games coming up and we'll talk about Pittsburgh in a second. We have Louisville away in two weeks um, that I think will be a decisive match as well. Leo Fernandez coming off the bench. I think is the best option for like his role coming yes. going forward. Also, like Charlie Dennis has kind of been playing where he played last year, and Charlie Dennis is having also an MVP quality, like caliber season, by the way. Charlie Dennis should be up there in the MVP candidate conversation. Um, so we might also are already have an MVP playing at that spot, but like I would love Leo to come off the bench in like the 65th, 70th minute for like Joshua Perez on the wing or um, or even I don't know, even even uh JJ Williams kind of like slot in behind Cal Jennings, um, give him that like free roam back there behind Jennings. Like, there's a lot of stuff you can do with Aaliyah Fernandez when he's healthy, when he's physically able to like move at 100. percent I'm not like again, I'm not a doctor. I was studying political science, so I, that's not a real science. Um, like I. I'm I'm not sure how quickly he can heal or if he's at 100 percent from the type of injury he had that kept him out for so long. Um, so if he can play at 100 percent, it's not going to be for 90 minutes. Is my no. hypothesis. No. If he can play at 100 percent, yeah. If he can play at 100 percent this season, it's going to be for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. You're pushing it, like you know what I mean. So. Yeah. I, I, I think if you're going to have him play at 100% and make the impact he can on a game, it's going to be in that latter portion. So I know we're like kind of including this in the Loudon recap. It has nothing to do with the game itself, but he was on the bench. And that's he was on the bench. News. It has to do with the game. It counts. Yeah. It's huge news, and it's definitely worth talking about going forward here because there's still two games left in the regular season and playoffs. I mean, who knows? Maybe you can have like a Stanley, uh, sorry, a Steven Stamkos moment 
in the 2020 Stanley Cup. If anybody remembers that, he's been injured like the whole playoffs and then comes in, scores a goal, and then just leaves. Just has a huge goal and contributes to the Stanley Cup. Like that would be very Leo Fernandez. Comes in the 80th minute, scores a game winner, and doesn't play again. Let's do that. Um, okay. Liz, I think give, we can give me, move on. Give me a Cal Jennings to Leo Fernandez goal, and and yeah. and my heart. Uh, I'll just be that. That's all I need. I genuinely think that's that would be a great combat. By the way, Cal Jennings yeah. and Leo Fernandez behind him in like that oh that spot God. where Charlie. Like, if they can come in and do that, I mean, Ariel Martinez has been kind of playing that role in the last oh, yeah. portion just, of the just, game. Oh man, okay, just side like side tangent. Can you imagine the season we would have if we had had Leo healthy? Oh right. my God! Unstoppable. I yeah. mean, maybe not our defense, but the rest of the goal yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, there's definitely. It's interesting to think about. Like, would Dennis and Leo have played together in the midfield? Like, would that mean that who would play? It'd be interesting to think about. Um, yeah. That being said, I think Leo Fernandez just kind of takes over Ariel Martinez's like last 10, 15 minutes of the game role. Um, so Ariel Martinez been doing a good job at that, by the way. So maybe they both come in. Who knows? Um, okay. Long tangent there about Leo Fernandez. <laughs> Let's bring it back to the actual game against Loudon, performance-wise. Liz, can we move on to the man of the match? Um, yes. Yeah, so my man of the match uh, was our sole go- goal scorer, Cal Jennings. Um, I, I, I have to admire the way he got the rebound on that. He was right there, ready for it. I just, I love it. That was so sick. Yeah. That was absolutely insane, by the way. Yeah. He, he and, and JJ Williams are different types of players, but they share one quality, which is they will chase the ball wherever it is. Yeah. Like and they, and they will they'll follow it like a hound. They'll follow that ball and they'll make something happen. And yeah. and Cal Jennings is kind of the king of that. Finding that narrow angle is absurd, by the way. And like it was the only goal it was decisive, and it's a really, really tough goal to finish. Um to put us, it was actually the game winning goal, right? So, yes. um, really, really impressive from him. The only reason I didn't pick him as my man of the match is because I pick him like all the time. So, I'm just gonna pick a guy that I also pick all the time, but I haven't picked him at least the past episodes. Um, Charlie Dennis, Charlie Dennis, my man of the match, um, just because he's a dog and he seems to be involved in every single offensive opportunity. He, like I said, has been having an MVP candidate type of season. He showed it again. He's involved up top. He gets back when he needs to. He just had a master class performance against Loudon. He's an all around talent. He really is. And he's just so like calm, cool, and collected about the, like how he goes about the game as well. Um, kind of like, I don't know, he attitude wise, very similar to like Lewis Hilton, but mm-hmm. more attacking. And it's been really, really fun to watch. Um, so it's good stuff going on right there for Charlie Dennis. Glad he's doing well. And he continued to have another great performance against Loudon. Um, yeah, let's move on. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know what I'm missing here. Before we jump into the Pittsburgh preview, um, let me give a shameless plug and say liking and subscribing is free. But if you need some new threads, you can support this podcast by heading over to shop.rblrsports.com and checking out all the cool designs we've cooked up. Link is in the description. Promo code COYR for 10% off. COYR for 10% off those cool shirts. Um, Karsten, my roommate, doesn't know I'm going to get him one. He's right here. But I'm going to use that promo code COYR for 10% off. Um, Karsten, you want to say out of the podcast? Oh, you hear that? C O Y R. C O Y R. C O Y R for ten percent off. Go yeah. to the website rblrsports.com. Okay, Liz, let's jump into the P- Pittsburgh preview. Kind of a, a big game. Some people are saying. Just, just, just a little bit. Just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a decent game. It's just the top board. team in the East. Just yeah. a little okay. bit. <laughs> Jokes aside, this is the biggest game of the season i think without a doubt at this point um, both teams have qualified for the playoffs obviously but it's the matchup of first versus second place um back when we played them and we lost one nothing in pittsburgh it was a matchup of first versus third it is now first versus second and we're closer than ever to catching up with them we are just three points behind doesn't seem like a lot but there's a couple tiebreakers to mention here um when it comes to catching up with pittsburgh and taking over that first place spot okay 
Again, they're in first place with 63 points. We're in second place with 60 points. They're undefeated in their last six games. They're having a really good stretch. They are the top team in the league for a reason. They've won five of those, and their only non-win was a draw away to San Antonio, one of the other top teams in the league. Uh, San Antonio is in second in the Western Conference. So that's all to say Pittsburgh is good at soccer. Right. Um, they have plenty of guys that can play fantastically. They kind of run with the same three slash five in the back formation that the Rowdies have been using earlier on in the season. Um, three with two wing backs slash five in the back. They have Jamaican international Jamali Waite, also a product of Big East Conference soccer, by the way. I saw him play my sophomore year against Georgetown where we did win. So I'm sure we can put up goals against him. It's the Rowdies. Um, but he's really, really good as well has actually gotten called up to the Jamaican national team several times at this point. Really, really young keeper with plenty of upside. I think he's going places, by the way. Like He, he has tons of talent. Um, Backline options for Pittsburgh also include Art- Arturo Ordonez, Joe Farrell, Nathan Dos Santos, Patrick Hogan. They also have some talented wingback options in Danny Rovira and Langston Blackstock. In the center, you can expect to see guys like Danny Griffin, Knardo Forbes, fantastic player, by the way, in there, Mark Ibarra, and former Rowdy, Junior Etu, who's having a really impressive season over there in Pittsburgh. Um, guy that for the Rowdies had, you know, I'm not saying this to say like he didn't play well for the Rowdies. He had a good, he had good times with the Rowdies, played good performances, uh, very similar to like Jan Ekra type player um, in that, you know, more defensive midfield role. But he's having like a really impressive season over there, and I think that's it's interesting to note um, for him. He's having a bit of a good run, to say the least, over there. They're obviously in first place for a reason. Offensive talent galore. But one guy who is by far the top scorer on the team is Albert Dicqua, who has 19 goals. The next leading scorer, by the way, for Pittsburgh. Um, oh, my gosh. Wait, hold on. I just had it pulled up. Albert Dicqua is the top scorer with 19 goals. And then the next top scorer is Ordonez with four, by the way. So if you're Nikki Law, I think there's a clear guy to be watching out for. (laughs) I I, I think, you know, the 15 goal disparity between first and second place should be an indicator that Albert Dicqua is the guy that they're looking to get the ball. That being said, they've had plenty of other guys get on the score sheet. They've had, uh, what, 14 other guys score um, at least a goal this season. So talent all around, guys that can get on the score sheet. Um, Ordonez has four. Uh, Edward Kizza has four goals. Uh, Tola Shawamni has four goals. So, I mean, there's plenty of guys behind that have also scored, but Albert Deke was their guy. Like He's, the, just... he's leading for the golden boot, right? I believe so. I, I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd be surprised if anybody's in front of him. He's got 19 yeah, I goals. Don't... I don't know he... if the USL... Oh, yeah, the USL must track that, of course. Yeah. yeah. That was um, a funny question. <laughs> and then, um, who was it? It's uh, Canardo Forbes that leads the assist category with 10 assists. Rovira has five. Biasi four. Ibarra, three. And Etu with two assists. Um, so, again... Dequa is the guy up top. Canardo Forbes is the guy in the midfield that we should be keeping an eye for. He's going to be finding Dequa. Like, that's the play, but it works. Like, you know what they're generally going to do. It's a matter of being able to stop it. It doesn't really matter if you know what they're going to do if you can't do anything about it. And that's kind of been the case for Pittsburgh's opponents. It's been, we know Dequa's going to get the ball. We know he's going to get on the score sheet. How do we prevent that? And the answer is you don't for the most part. You kind of just try to score more goals. But they have an impressive bag line as well, by the way. Um, yeah, they've held some decent teams to, you know, not many goals. Um, they had trouble against Hartford away for whatever reason. Barely got out of there with a 4-3 win. But, I mean, I don't know. Every really good team has some weird down performances. So I, I wouldn't really... Well, maybe it was the case of us against uh, Loudon playing yeah. down. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I wouldn't be like put too much weight on a result like that. The point is, they're really good. Dequa scoring goals like every game. So I don't know. I, I I don't know what the strategy is. I played again, like I said, I downloaded Football Manager a couple weeks ago for the first time. There's like a feature on there where you can just like 
attach a central midfielder to another player and he's just following him around the whole time. That might be what you want to do with Dequa, honestly. You put like a Jan Ekra on him just the whole game. You're just watching Dequa. Like, honestly, not that bad a strategy. I should be a head coach. No, yeah. Like, oh, abs- yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely want to keep a man on him at all times, if not two, honestly. Yeah. Um, I This is going to be a, a tough game. Um, I I don't know. I don't I, – I don't have high hopes, unfortunately. We are going to be at home, so that's something for us. Um, we are coming off a couple of wins, so that's something too. We have Lasso. He's getting, he's back in form. Like he, he really seemed like he was at his. He's getting back to like a hundred percent or playing at a hundred percent in the last game. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Just trying to see if I, I forgot if I wrote something for that. But honestly, um, I, I. I'm hesitant to be optimistic just because of our defense. Yeah, I, I will say, I mean, they're scoring lots of goals in their last four games. They scored three goals, two goals, two goals, three goals. So that's, what, five, ten goals in their last four games. They're in a good scoring streak right now against pretty decent teams as well. Um, they got held scoreless against San Antonio in San Antonio, but, again, San Antonio is a fantastic team at home. We're also a fantastic team at home, by the way. Like, I, I feel like in thinking about these games, we think about Pittsburgh and like they're really, really good right now, which is true. But we're also in a really good run right now. We only had that random loss to Memphis when our back line was really, really narrow then. Our back line is kind of back to like not normal, but good with Guillen back. It would be like great. So I'm honestly not. Who concerned that we're gonna get like you know? I, I don't think it's gonna be like that game against Memphis where we concede like four goals. That just doesn't happen anymore, especially with like Lasso and Kleeman in there. Like Kleeman is good. Lasso is really good. He's had some mistakes this season, but I mean these are guys that should hold, you know, be able to hold their own against a good Pittsburgh team. And we're scoring lots of goals, so I think it's gonna be really really close. And it's going to come down to a couple moments of brilliance for either team. Yeah. Like, it's not really like a tactical approach where you can be like, this is the key to beating Pittsburgh. Or if you're Pittsburgh, there's not really a tactical approach to seeing, to being like, this is how we beat the Rowdies. Like, both teams are just completely solid from top to bottom. So it's really just going out there and like making something happen, playing your game, hoping the other team makes a mistake, and then having like, a Charlie Dennis banger from outside the box or a Cal Jennings like insane run like he usually pulls out of nowhere, right? So you need something like that. Either team needs something like that to win against the other team. So I think it's going to be really close. So I I fully think it's going to be like a coin toss. By the way, their leading scorer has 19 goals and the next one has four goals. Cal Jennings, who was your man of the match, has 17 goals this year. And he started plenty of games off the bench, by the way. Like, I think Cal Jennings, he's right behind Dequa with less playing time. And then on top of that, we also have J.J. Williams with 11 goals. And then Charlie Dennis with 11 goals. Like, there's guys that are right behind him in a way that Pittsburgh doesn't really have. So I'm saying that to say Pittsburgh's attack is kind of... It's not one dimensional. That's not what I mean to say, but it's it's relatively predictable in that way. I think that's something we have going for us is that we have plenty of guys that can score. So, and that yeah, we course. don't. Yeah, we're not focusing uh, most of our offense, you know, on on maybe getting the ball to one player. You know, we have a lot exactly. more options. Exactly, we have. Um, nine. And I I would say that speaks almost to yeah. the Rowdies, uh, Cal Jennings being like spreading the ball around, like not necessarily going for the goal because he wants the glory of it, you know, passing it to the right person at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we scored nine more goals than them this season in Pittsburgh. So offensive is really clicking. They've conceded six less than us this season. Um, a couple anomalies throughout the season for us though, including that four goal game against Memphis, a couple injuries throughout the season, like, I don't put too much weight into that. So all that being said, let me just, before we jump into the score prediction, mention 
a little bit about the tiebreakers because we, we're coming up. There's two games left in the regular season. It's this game against Pittsburgh and then away to Louisville. Pittsburgh has us away, obviously, and then they go away to Detroit to finish the year. Detroit is not that good, but Detroit's going to play at home against Pittsburgh, and they can occasionally pull some decent results out at home, uh, believe it or not. They've had a couple of those throughout the year. They beat Louisville at home 2-0. Um, they beat San Antonio at home 2-0. Birmingham at home 1-0. Like, they can pull out some good results at home, so hopefully they come in clutch for us against Pittsburgh. But my like the reason I'm saying all that is if we win, we obviously go tie in points with Pittsburgh, right? The first tiebreaker is head-to-head points earned in the regular season. Um which would mean if we win, Pittsburgh beat us earlier this year. So you go to the next tiebreaker because we both get three points off each other if we win. The next tiebreaker would be goal differential and head-to-head games. So if we win by one, then you have to go to the next tiebreaker because they also beat us by one. If we win by two or more goals, then we have that tiebreaker. And should we still be tied by the end of the year, um, that should carry us into that first place spot. So... That's all depending on us winning first, by the way. Like we still have to win. But if you could pick the score, you'd want to win by mm-hmm. two or more because that, that, that tiebreaker is going to be huge um, in determining who ultimately ends up in first place should we get the win this weekend. Because the next tiebreaker is points per game versus in-conference opponents in regular season league games. And Pittsburgh actually is edging us out on that. They have more points. Their points per game is higher versus in-conference opponents than ours is. So if it gets to that, if we win by one on Saturday and then by the end of the season we're still tied with Pittsburgh, they would carry that tiebreaker into the first place spot. So very confusing, kind of. I'm explaining it very poorly, but the point is if we win, we want to win by at least two goals to hold that tiebreaker. If we're so what I'm winning. hearing is two goals and we're on the field. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's it. That's it. All right. All that being said, Liz, your prediction for this weekend and essentially for how, you know, the end of the regular season plays out. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm not very hopeful, unfortunately. I know I just sounded very enthusiastic, but I, I do think it might be a one, two loss. I think we might get a goal, but I think we might get scored on more, unfortunately. Um, I, I hate I hate to be James. Sorry, James. Yeah, that's a very James-esque prediction. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I, I think I'm spoiling it by my reaction, but I do think we can and will win this weekend if we play our game. I think defensively, we have the capabilities to shut Pittsburgh out if we really play really, really well. I don't think we will. My prediction is going to be a 2-1 win. So not that by two goals win. I hope we do win by two goals. But I think offensively, we have too much going for us to not get a couple on the board. Pittsburgh solid defensively. I think we are also solid defensively and can come up with enough backline strength to hold them to one goal. Hopefully zero goals. But my official prediction is 2-1. If we win by two, I will be ecstatic. Um, And then it all comes down to that game against Louisville the following weekend, which has its own set of challenges playing in Louisville. But you know what? One game at a time. Let's win by two or one. I really don't care if we win by one, still in a good spot. Um, And yeah, so I think that's my prediction officially is 2-1. I feel pretty confident, believe it or not. It's a really, really tough game. We're playing at home, though, and, and playing in Pittsburgh is so much more challenging than playing at home because their field is so narrow. Um, that's what some of the players have said too. It's like really hard to play the game we play, which is a wide game. We like to spread the field, get guys out on the wing. We can do that much more at home than we can do in Pittsburgh. Might be a big factor, and it could play to our advantage. So we'll see how that works out. Eureka, the producer's prediction is a 1 1 draw. And the guest spot for this week goes to Santiago Pombo. By the way, of the newly founded, is that too strong a word? The newly started at RBLR Deportes branch. 
of this show. Um, yeah, so keep an eye out for that. First episodes of that coming out pretty, pretty soon. Um, all of your RBLR coverage in Spanish, hosted by yours truly, Santiago Pombo. Um, follow at RBLR Deportes on Twitter. Um, and I'll mention that again later on. But that's a long way of saying his score prediction is a 2-1 win like me. Great prediction on his part, I think. So that's all to say. We have a win, draw, and a loss prediction in here. I I think it's indicative of how this game could go. It really could go either way. But we're playing at home, on our field, in good form. I think it's going to push us over the edge. Liz, concluding thoughts on this game. It's not going to be boring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dequa. It's, it's literally Rowdy's versus Dequa. Um, let's yeah. just not let him score and we're in business. Jan Ekra, just Mark. Oh, oh you wanted him. actual like deep thoughts. Okay. You, okay. You didn't no, want I, commentary. I, My bad. <laughs> I literally, whatever, literally whatever. You have any, you have any deeper thoughts than, uh, than it won't be boring. No, I just think it won't be boring. Honestly. That means I couldn't tell you how I think it's going to go. It's a good way to put it. It really is a toss up. Um, essentially going to determine how the rest of the season plays out by the way. Um, only two games left, so that's not really like dramatic to say. Um, yeah, final predictions. Me, I'm taking a 2-1 win. Liz taking a 1-2 loss. Eureka taking a 1-1 draw. And Santiago Pombo of RBLR Deportes uh, taking a 2-1 win. Finally, moving on to the last segment um, that we amicably call Extra Time. Um, there's nothing in here. Uh, so there's not much to say in the broader world of soccer. I mean, there's Champions League soccer going on, Europa League, Conference League stuff. Um, what I will say on my own personal soccer world, um, the team my dad and I follow, Liga de Quito, did actually go into Argentina, get the result they needed. They got the nil-nil draw, and they Yay. qualified to the final of the Copa Sudamericana in Uruguay in October. Um, so everybody pull for them. It's going to be a crazy final against Fortaleza from Brazil. Um, by the way, the Copa Sudamericana is like the Europa League of South America for anybody that's okay. not really familiar with South American soccer. Um, huge, huge tournament, huge opportunity for Ecuadorian soccer once again to kind of keep our name um, up there. And it's an awesome opportunity for the team my dad and I follow to be part of that history. So really, really fun stuff coming up there. The final is Friday, October 28th. Um, so it's at the end of this month in year Y. Going to be a crazy one. Um, and that's all I have. Liz, do you have anything else from the wider world in soccer? Um, nothing too crazy, unfortunately. No news about the women's team in Tampa Bay, unfortunately. Still nothing. No! Uh, they tweet and they tweet, but they tweet nothing of content. And it yeah. Me. yeah, that's fair. That's fair. All right. I think that's about it for extra time then. I mean, Eureka made me really sad when he mentioned the Rays earlier. It's not soccer, but I just want to take a moment of silence for the Rays season that ended so sadly, so abruptly in like the worst, most embarrassing way possible at home, in two games, in front of a library crowd. It was just terrible. Everything was bad about that series. And I think we can just throw this season away and focus on yeah. the Rowdies playoffs now. Um, yep. Usually it's a lot more fun when the Rowdies and the Rays playoffs are happening at the same time. Unfortunately, it will just be the Rowdies. That should be enough for everybody in St. Pete to go out to what will be at least one home game um, this year. So go out and support the Rowdies. There's a team in the playoffs in St. Pete. It's not the baseball team, but your Tampa Bay Rowdies will be there. Big game this weekend. Be there as well. Okay. That's all from the RBLR Rowdies crew, Carlos and Liz and James from Scotland. Uh, make sure to give us a follow at RBLR Sports on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, follow me on Twitter at Carlos TPA 10. I have been basically for the past like 24 hours exclusively tweeting about Liga de Quito, um, LDU Quito, uh, how it's like, you know, written out sometimes if you're ever looking around and you see a big U in blue and red, um, 
just insane stuff over there. And, you know, if you want to learn about the world of South American soccer, that's been my timeline for the past 24 hours. So at Carlos DPO 10, if you want to drop a follow there, we're soon back to your regularly scheduled Rowdy's content this Saturday. Liz, where can we find you on social media? Um, you can find me at Lizzie the Lion with a zero as the O in Lion on Twitter. I tweet about the Rowdies, women's soccer, and stupid memes. There you go. Rowdies, women's soccer, and stupid memes. Not Lizzie the Lion. That's all we need in the Rowdies rush. Okay. Again, one more time, like and subscribe to our podcast, whether wherever you listen to your podcast, and get the full experience on YouTube. We're here on Spotify, our Heart Radio, Apple, and Google Podcasts. With that being said, one more week of Rowdy's content, another big game ahead. Come on, you Rowdy's. Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLR Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.